The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC for short, is the largest particle accelerator in the world. A particle accelerator is a machine that accelerates elementary particles, um, those that make up atoms, such as electrons or protons, at very high energies. On a basic level, particle accelerators produce beams of charged particles that can be used for a variety of research purposes. There are two basic types of particle accelerators. You have linear accelerators and circular accelerators. Linear accelerators propel particles along a linear or straight uh, beam line. Circular accelerators, as the name suggests, propel, propel particles around a circular track. Uh, linear accelerators are used for fixed target experiments where the art particles they're trying to aim at don't move, whereas circular accelerators can be used for both colliding particles and for fixed target experiments. Particle accelerators use electric fields to speed up and increase the energy of beam particles, of a beam of particles, which are steered and focused by magnetic fields. Again, um, the particle source provides the particles, such as protons or electrons, that are to be accelerated. Uh, the beam of particles travels inside a vacuum in the metal beam pipe. The vacuum is crucial. Uh, it maintains an air and dust free environment for the beam of particles to travel unobstructed. Uh, electromagnets steer and focus the beam of particles while it travels through the vacuum tube. Electric fields spaced around the accelerator switch from positive to negative at a given frequency, creating a wave um, that accelerates particles in bunches. Particles can be directed at a fixed target, as I said before, such as a thin piece of metal foil or the two beams of particles can be collided. Particle detectors, re particle detectors record and reveal the particles and radiation that are produced by the collision between a beam of particles and the target that they're aiming for. Particle accelerators are essential tools of discovery for particle and nuclear physics and for sciences that use X-rays and neutrons, a type of neutral subatomic particle. Um, particle physics, also called high energy physics, asks basic questions about the universe with particle accelerators as their primary scientific tools. Particle physicists have achieved a profound understanding of the fundamental particles and physical laws that govern matter, energy and space and time using particle accelerators. Um, over the last four decades alone, uh, light sources accelerators including producing photons sorry light sources which are accelerators producing photons uh, the subatomic particle responsible for electromagnetic radiation and the sciences that use them have made dramatic advances that cut across many fields of research uh, today there are about 10,000 scientists in the US alone using x-ray beams for research in physics and chemistry and also uh, with knock-on effects in biology and medicine, earth sciences, and many more aspects um, in the scientific world. That's just particle accelerators in the background, or in a nutshell. Um, we're here today to talk about the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest particle accelerator in the world. It's based in CERN, uh, which is located in Geneva, in Switzerland. Well, uh, yeah, one of the bases is in Geneva and Switzerland. The Large Hadron Collider is fucking huge. Um, the physicists and engineers at CERN use the world's largest and most complex scientific instruments to study the basic consti constituents of matter, fundamental particles, um, such as the protons, neutrons and electrons we were talking about earlier. Subatomic particles are made to collide together at close to the speed of light, which is fucking quick. <laughs> the process uh, gives us clues about how the particles interact and provides insights into the fundamental laws of nature. CERN wants to advance the boundaries of human knowledge by delving into the smallest building blocks of our universe. Um, a lot of my sources come from CERN themselves, so they might be a little bit biased, but you know... Um if you don't praise yourself, no one will. <laughs> I like CERN. They they do good things, as far as I can tell. Uh, it was founded in 1954. Um, it sits on the Franco-Swiss border, near enough to Geneva. 
Um, it is one of Europe's first joint ventures and now has 23 member states. Um, at, an inter- inter- at, <laughs> at an intergovernmental meeting of UNESCO, uh, which is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, um, in Paris in December 1951, the first resolution concerning the establishment of European Council for Nuclear Research, which in French is the... I'm going to fucking butcher this. Conseil European pour la recherche nucléaire, which in an acronym is CERN, CERN, um, was adopted. So at an intergovernmental meeting of UNESCO in 1951 in Paris. They come up, came up with the idea to make a European Council for Nuclear Research. Not, well, I suppose it's all kind of the one thing, but not like nuclear weapons we're talking about here, but like the, the research of nuclear particles. Um, so like atoms and stuff, small, tiny little things. Uh, two months later, an agreement was signed establishing the Provisional Council, uh, the acronym CERN was born. Uh, today, our understanding of matter goes much deeper than the nucleus of the atom, and CERN's main area of research is particle physics. Because of this, the laboratory operated by CERN is often referred to as the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. CERN is run by 23 member states, as I said, um, each of which has two official delegates in the CERN Council, One represents his or her government's administration, and the other one represents national scientific interests. Um, Each member state has a single vote, and most decisions require a simple majority, although they do strive to have a decision that is as close to unanimous as possible. They try to get everyone on board with the ideas that they're going forward with, because it takes a group effort to to do the things that CERN does. It's it's one of the more forward-thinking... Um, well, I suppose all scientific research bases are forward-thinking, but this is a big one. CERN does a lot of shit. And I'm going to reference them in a lot of future podcasts to come, because um, just looking through their website has given me a lot of ideas. If you want to know anything about particle physics, go to the CERN website. It's They have their own domain, home.cern. I'll have the link in the description. Um just go to it man it's it's fantastic um but that's enough about cern uh we're going to talk we're here to talk about the large hadron collider as i said it is the world's largest and the most powerful particle accelerator in in the world i already said that <laughs> but I've, I've committed now it first started up on the 10th of, De- of september sorry 2008 and remains the latest addition to CERN's accelerator complex. They've got more than just the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the LHC consists of a 27-kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures to boost the energy of the particles along the way. Um, inside the accelerator, two high-energy particle beams travel at close to the speed of light before they are made to collide. The beams travel in opposite directions in separate beam pipes. Two tubes kept at ultra-high vacuum um, are basically what holds the the channels for uh, the beams to go along. As I said, the vacuum is important because we don't want these particles crashing into anything on the way and we definitely don't want any friction because we want them to go as fast as possible. Um, the particles are guided around the accelerator ring by strong magnetic fields maintained by superconducting electromagnets. The electromagnets are built from coils of special electric cable that operates in a superconducting state, which means it efficiently uh, conducts electricity without resistance or loss of energy. Um, That's what a superconductor is. This requires chilling the magnets to absolute zero. That is zero Kelvin if you use the Kelvin scale or minus 271.3 or I think minus, I think absolute zero is minus 272 degrees Celsius. But these get down to around 207, minus 271.3 degrees Celsius. That is actually colder than most of outer space. <laughs> there's, there's 
I don't know. I don't think anyone knows, but there are probably a few places that get a little bit closer to absolute zero. And this is one of the places that gets down to it. <laughs> the CERN is a fucking plethora of geniuses. They can make things ridiculously cold. Um, they do that by connecting the accelerator to a distribution system of liquid helium. Um, which cools the magnets as well as uh, other supply services. Um, just to get back to absolute zero, it's it's one of these things that we know probably exists, but we haven't found any rec- rec- anything that has absolute zero. That is something that has no heat at all. Everything that has mass has energy and energy is usually heat energy from what I remember from college anyway (laughs) Um, absolute zero is something that has no energy at all it's an unheard of thing well not unheard of obviously we're talking about it but it's it's not something that you can come across in your day-to-day life a lot of people think that zero degrees celsius is like oh there's no heat there because water freezes but there's still heat in ice there's still heat in like the deepest ice caves the deepest glaciers there's still heat in there it's not enough to keep you alive obviously relative to humans it's fucking freezing but on an absolute scale there's heat there everywhere on earth has a certain amount of heat regardless of how cold it is there's heat there Minus 272 degrees Celsius is as cold as it gets. It doesn't get colder than that. It is impossible to have anything with... You can't have negative energy. Now, we did talk about dark energy before, but that's a different story altogether. (laughs) Um, And we may talk about antimatter in the future, and there may be something to tie in with energy to do with that. So I may be contradicting myself in the future, but at the moment, as it stands, nothing gets colder than absolute zero. I know, I know that. That's why it's called absolute zero. Zero Kelvin. But anyway, we'll, we'll move on. That's enough about temperatures. Um, in the LHC, thousands of magnets of different varieties and sizes are used to direct the beams. Um, these include 1,232 dipole magnets, 15 meters in length, uh, which bend the beams, and 392 quadrupole magnets each five to seven meters long, which focus the beams. That's a lot of fucking magnets. Um, Just prior to collision, another type of magnet is used to squeeze the particles closer together to increase the chances of collisions. Um, I imagine that's a secret because I couldn't find out what type of fucking magnet that was. (laughs) Um, Particles that they're firing at each other, you, you have to understand they're so tiny that the task of making them collide is like firing two needles 10 kilometers apart that they meet exactly in the middle and like hit perfectly that's that's the time that's like a, a good analogy for it. it's such a difficult task and they often miss um all the controls for the accelerator uh, its services and technical infrastructure are housed under one roof at the cern control center Uh, From here, the beams inside the LHC are made to collide at four locations around the accelerator ring, uh, corresponding to the positions of four particle detectors. The four bases are ATLAS, CMS, ALICE, and LHC-B. If you go to CERN's website right now, uh, home.cern, as I said earlier, you can actually see what the LHC is doing in real time. it's not very entertaining at the moment because it's actually on, <laughs> on its uh, one of its long shutdowns. Um, the next beam is planned for spring 2021, so keep an eye out for it. It might be interesting to watch. Um, the Large Hadron Collider was a big news story recently enough, well, recently enough in my lifetime. If you're younger than me, then it would have been fucking ages ago. <laughs> um... for one reason it found evidence of the Higgs boson and to understand what the Higgs boson is we need to talk about forces 
um, from walking on the street to launching a rocket into space to fucking sticking a magnet on your refrigerator, uh, physical forces act all around us. But all the forces that we experience every day, and many that we don't realize we experience, can be whittled down to four fundamental forces. There is gravity, the weak force, electromagnetism, and the strong force. These are called the four fundamental forces of nature, and they govern everything that happens in the universe. Yeah, we've gotten down to basically the four things that control everything. These are like the fucking infinity stones <laughs> of science. Gravity, as you've obviously probably heard before, because I've harped on about it like a fucking maniac, is the attract. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Gravity is the attraction between two objects that have mass or energy. So every fucking object in the world. Whether this is seen in dropping a rock from the bridge, a planet orbiting a star, or the moon causing ocean tides, um, gravity is probably the most intuitive and familiar of the fundamental forces, but it's also been one of the most challenging to explain. We know gravity exists. We don't know why it exists. You know, whatever. Um, the weak force, also called the weak nuclear interaction, is responsible for particle decay. This is the literal change of one type of somatomic one type of somatomic particle into another. So, for example, a neutrino that strays close to a neutron can turn the neutron into a proton while the neutrino becomes an electron. That's difficult to follow. Um, but it's just the change of particles. <coughs> Physicists describe this interaction through the exchange of force carrying particles called bosons. Specific types, specific types of bosons are responsible for the weak force, electromagnetic force and the strong force. In the weak force, um, the bosons are charged particles called W and Z bosons. Uh, when some atomic particles such as protons, neutrons and electrons come within 10 to the minus 18 meters or 0.1% of the diameter of a proton, which is fucking tiny, of one another, they can exchange these bosons. As a result, the subatomic particles decay into new particles, uh, according to Georgia State University's Hyperphysics website. Hyperphysics, it's a great website. It's just it's just diagrams and <laughs> it's literally just diagrams and equations, and it looks it looks great. It's easy for me to follow. I like that. I don't like people waffling on. I, I've just realised I said that, and now I'm waffling on. <clears throat> That's essentially what this podcast is. A little bit of knowledge, but most waffle. Mostly waffle. Um, the weak force is critical for the nuclear fusion reactions that power the sun and produce the energy needed for most life forms here on Earth. It is also why archaeologists can use the carbon-14 um, dating mechanism, or mechanism? Dating technique um, on ancient bones, uh, wood and other formerly living artifacts. Carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. Uh, one of those neutrons decays into a proton to make nitrogen-14, which has seven protons and seven neutrons. This decay happens at a predictable rate, allowing scientists to determine how old such artifacts are. Time to go on a tangent. <laughs> Did you know that carbon four like, we've actually changed what modern... We, there's a definition for what modern day is because of the effectiveness of carbon-14 dating. Um, in the year 1950, it was determined by scientists now that there's so much carbon in the atmosphere because of human interaction and because of us burning fossil fuels and fucking, fucking up the environment. That's another podcast. <laughs> because there's we fucked up the world so much, we put so much carbon into the atmosphere, it's actually affected carbon dating. Because there's so much carbon in things. So carbon dating only works up to the year 1950. Because that's when we reach the point of too much carbon. So everything that has died after 1950, carbon dating is useless on. That's why we refer to 1950 to as onwards. I say it to present day, but I don't think we're going to fucking reduce all the carbon in the world for a fucking long time. Although they are making filters. But anyway, 
everything from 1950 on is modern day because of that because we fucked up so much <laughs> that's come next month that's 70 years 70 years is basically the same on carbon dating now 70 years isn't a long time in all of time but you know it's crazy that that is why everything from 1950 on is modern day and carbon dating is useless after that but very effective before that. Um, right, that's enough about the weak force. We'll get back to it later. <laughs> um, third force is the electromagnetic force. Um, it's also called the Lorentz force. Um, it acts between two particles of charge. Um, like negatively charged particles... Sorry, like negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons. Um, opposite charges attract one another. We see this with magnets, so you put the positive to the negative. Um, while like charges repel. So if you put a positive to a positive, they'll repel. The greater the charge, the greater the force. And much like gravity, this force can be felt from an infinite distance. Uh, although when you get very far away, the force is very, 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 very small. Um, you kind of you know that intuitively if you've ever played with a magnet you know what the electromagnetic force is and everyone's played with magnets go to your fridge there's probably like 10 of them on it from Spain and probably from Tunisia or Lanzarote if you're living in Ireland a lot of Irish people go to Lanzarote they've probably got a Lanzarote fridge magnet on your fridge <laughs> you know what magnets are the strong nuclear force also called the strong nuclear interaction is the strongest of the four fundamental forces of nature. Get ready. <laughs> it is 6,000 trillion, 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 that's 39 zeros after six, times stronger than the force of gravity, according to hyperphysics. And that's because it binds the fundamental particles of matter together to form larger particles. It holds together the quarks that make up protons and neutrons, and part of the strong force also keeps the protons and neutrons of an atom's nucleus together. Much like the weak force, the strong force operates only when some atomic particles are extremely close to one another. Um, they have to be somewhere within 10 to the negative, 10 to the minus 15 meters from each other, or roughly within the diameter of a proton, according to the hyperphysics website. Um, the strong force is odd, though, because unlike any of the other fundamental forces, it gets weaker as some of had some. Uh, oh, Jesus, I'll start that again. The strong force is odd, though, because unlike any other of the funda other fundamental forces, uh, it gets weaker as some atomic particles move closer together. It actually reaches maximum strength when the particles are farthest away from each other, according to Fermilab. Um, once within range, massless charged particles, sorry, massless charged bosons called gluons transmit the strong, strong force between quarks and keep them glued together. I, I think that's why they're called gluons. I don't know why. It just makes sense. <laughs> gluons glue things together. A tiny fraction of the strong force called the residual strong force acts between the protons and neutrons. Protons in the nucleus repel one another because of their similar, char similar charge, but the residual strong force can overcome this repulsion so the particles stay bound in the atom's nucleus. The strong force is just like, fuck you. <laughs> I'm just going to keep everything together because I'm the strong force. So, now that we know all about the four fundamental forces of nature, we can talk about the Higgs boson. In the 1970s, Physicists realized that there was very close ties between two of the four fundamental forces, the weak force and the electromagnetic force. The two forces can be described within the same theory, which forms the basis of the standard model. Um, this unification implies that electricity, magnetism, light, and some types of radioactivity are all manifestations of a single underlying force known as the electroweak force. The basic equations of the unified theory correctly describe the electroweak force and its associated force carrying particles, namely the photon and the W and Z bosons we mentioned earlier. 
except for one major problem. All of these particles emerge without a mass. While this is true for the photon, we know that the W and Z proton bosons have mass nearly 100 times that of a proton. Fortunately, theorists uh, Robert Brout, Francois Engler, and Peter Higgs made the proposal that was to solve this problem. What we now call the brout engler higgs mechanism gives a mass to the W and Z when they interact with an invisible field, now called the Higgs field, which pervades the universe. So, according to them, just after the Big Bang, the Higgs field was zero. But as the universe cooled and the temperature fell below a critical value, the field grew spontaneously so that any part interacting with it acquired a mass. The more a particle interacts with this field, the heavier it is. Particles like the photon that do not interact with it are left with no mass at all. Like all fundamental fields, the Higgs field has an associated particle, the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is the visible manifestation of the Higgs field, rather like a wave at the surface of a sea, of the sea. I suppose assy works too. Um, a problem for many years has been that no experiment was able to observe the Higgs boson to confirm the theory. We knew it was there, we just couldn't prove it. On the 4th of July, 2012, the ATLAS and CMS experiments... I just kicked my table. <laughs> the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider announced that they had observed a new particle and... It was in the mass region of around 125 GeV. I don't know what that means. <laughs> this particle is consistent with the Higgs boson, but it will take further work to determine whether or not it is actually the Higgs boson, predicted by the standard model. The Higgs boson, as proposed within the standard model, is the simplest manifestation of the brout engler higgs mechanism. Um, other types of Higgs bosons are predicted by other theories that go beyond the standard model. Um, after all this, on the 8th of October 2013, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded jointly to Francois Engler and Peter Higgs for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass of some atomic particles, and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. I don't want the significance of this discovery to be lost on you. This is, if you've ever heard of it being referred to as the God particle, they're not really wrong. <laughs> it's basically the thing that gives everything mass. If we didn't have mass, we wouldn't have energy, and there wasn't energy, that we couldn't do anything, and I wouldn't be able to talk to you, and there wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be able to look at the computer screen I'm looking at right now, and nothing would happen if this Higgs field didn't exist. And now that we know it exists, we know we can trace back the Big Bang Theory a bit more. It's another piece to the puzzle of how we got here, and what was there before, and... What the fuck happened at the Big Bang? Why was there a Big Bang? Was there something before the Big Bang? We don't know. But we know what's happening after it. We're figuring it out as we go along. It's going to be another fucking... <sighs> I'm not going to put time on it, but I don't think we're ever going to actually know exactly what happened. We're never going to... I don't think humans were ever going to figure out why we're here, or how we're here, what happened, why the universe is the way it is, why it exists... It's just not something that is going to just occur to someone on a, on a fucking... You're just going to wake up one day and be like, oh, the Big Bang. Got that figured out. No, maybe it wasn't the Big Bang. Like, I fucking... I pretty much know what it was based on the research I've done and the research that countless people have done. But yeah, the Higgs boson, the God particle, is just another piece of the puzzle. And it's thanks to the work of the 23 member states of CERN working together to, cr to find out shit, <laughs> to get more knowledge. And that's what's important. The more knowledge we have, the better we can be. And the better we are, the more we can help each other. 
and that's another step towards eventually peace am I overreaching maybe I am but anyway <laughs> that's enough about the Large Hadron Collider because I'm just going to branch off into nonsense um, yeah if you like that podcast let me know um, write something in the comments down below give it a like if you liked it share it with your friends if you would like to contribute to the podcast I also have a Patreon set up where you can buy me a cup of coffee every month um, this podcast is fueled by coffee uh, as is the rest of my life and I don't think I'd be able to do it without it actually I, I know for a fact I wouldn't be able to do it without it I do it in, in my spare time um, I don't have a lot of that with the training for the marathon and work and trying to organize a wedding that I'm, I'm getting married next year <laughs> if uh, if anyone didn't didn't know about that we're trying to plan that out um, but yeah if you'd like to contribute I'd vastly appreciate it I don't expect anyone to I, I basically don't want anyone to <laughs> I know it would be great I like coffee but um, someone gave me the idea to do it and I was like why not you know if you don't ask you can't receive <laughs> but again Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something today and hopefully you learn something in the next one. Bye-bye.